Every time I tell the story, I still get choked up. As a kid growing up, my dad struggled with alcoholism, and that dysfunction in the family made its way into the family business as well. I'd been working in the shop since I was age five, and I got used to the screaming matches on the shop floor, the pornography on the walls. So by the time I was 18, 19, something felt very, very dark and wrong, and I desperately wanted out. I was depressed, drinking heavily. I had smashed up two cars, and running was my escape. And on one of those runs, all of a sudden, a voice comes out of the bushes. And I, I looked around going, who's playing a joke on me? And the voice very simply said, you are not alone. And the immediate sense was, I've been with you through all of it, through all of it. In that instant, I knew God was more real than I could ever imagine. So what do you do with that realization that you're here for a purpose? You're not an accident. What are you gonna do with your life? My name is David Haytag, second generation owner and president of Edgerton Gear. We make gears for machines that make every aluminum can on the planet. We make gears for every cardboard box. We make gears for construction equipment, logging equipment, food processing equipment, textile equipment. Edgerton Gear was founded in 1962. My mom, she started doing the books. My dad, he's a brilliant uh, mechanical guy. So together as a very young couple in their 20s, they're trying to figure this thing out of how do you get customers? How do you take care of the customers? How do you do the books? They understood that if you're gonna be successful, you have to get the customer what they need when they need it. But managing people is a whole different animal. You know, he grew up in a tavern. The tavern was downstairs from their home. And he was incredibly charismatic. He was a, he's a great relational guy, but it was always around, you gotta have a beer. He had a quarter barrel of beer in the fridge. Pornography started showing up in the lunchroom and so on. And the guy's going out and getting drunk at lunch and then coming back. So without paying attention or really understanding how to manage that part of a, a company, things really dissolved into chaos. And it drove me out. I ran away when I was 22 and said I'd never be back. So I left Wisconsin thinking I needed to go serve God somewhere, anywhere but, but Edgerton. <laughs> I was very confident God could work anywhere in the world, but he can't fix my family. He can't fix Edgerton gear. But God said, you just want to run away. But this is where I want you, to deal with a lot of messiness and brokenness. So coming back to this, um, it wasn't a matter of yay, it was a matter of obedience. And I often half joke, but it's only a half joke. When we came back, it, it was hell. And then it got worse. It wasn't fun. You didn't know what each day was going to bring, who was going to be crabby that day, who was going to be I don't know, a troublemaker. Chaos is a good word. There were no rules and boundaries, and Dave was pulling his hair out with uh, the way the company was running because he was trying to do everything with no cooperation by a lot of the people here. Simple things created a lot of conflict. Like, Dad, we can't have a raging party at 1.30 every afternoon in the lunchroom. Dad, we can't have the quarter barrel beer, period. Those kind of things just kept blowing up, and he couldn't understand why I was trying to alienate some of his drinking buddies and why I was trying to change things. And in a lot of ways, I was one of those drinking guys. I did my apprenticeship here, and I was one of those guys that just wanted to hang out and you know look at porn and sit and drink or just go out and, and be rowdy. So to come back into the business as a changed person, everybody really had a hard time comprehending, my family especially. And so to come back and try to govern the company with truth and, and trust and open communication and, and all those kingdom values that we want to 
put in place was met with sabotage and resistance. Uh, we did have screaming matches. Uh, I had an absolute mutiny uh, among the staff. I remember we were, at one point, we had a, a group of mentors that were supporting me, and the, the counselor turned to me and he said, so, um, are you happy? And I remember the question, are you happy, stunned me, and I, and I thought about it for a second, and I turned and looked at him and I said, I didn't think happiness was the issue. I thought obedience was. And it had, it had been years of <clears throat> trying to be obedient, honoring my parents, uh, trying to love my wife and my kids, and trying to run a business in an ethical kingdom way. In the middle of all this chaos for 10 years, nothing seemed to be working. And it was just this really long, slow slog. But we realized, man, we need people with character, people that are buying into the culture of who we are. That became our mantra. We're not gonna hire for skills, we're gonna hire for character. So it became this mission of how do we get enough good people to outweigh the bad people? Because making gears is easy. Fixing people is hard. And to be honest, I think some people is just like, um, I'm not into that. I just want to make gears. So you start looking for newer people with the energy that want to jump on board. When I did start working here, I was nervous. I'm like a machine shop, you know, they're probably hardy people, you know, they work long hours, you know, they're probably tough, but it was super nice people. You know, it's an actual happy environment. You feel like you're an actual person and you can talk to your uh, coworkers. The work is, is gratifying. You feel good at the end of the day that you've really got something done. And uh, just pride in, in what, what we do here and, and accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, of course, my boss, um, the owner of the company, really cared about me. That's why I felt comfortable being a machinist. The community here at Edgerton Gear is, uh, oh, I mean, well, it really, it means everything, right? We gotta have the right people that you can get along with, you can have fun with. They wanna be able to express their creativity. They wanna have a sense of ownership. One thing that we do consistently, every Thursday we have company meeting, and we share our numbers. We share the good, the bad, the ugly. We'll do bonuses, random bonuses, three, four times a year, where, hey, we had another record month, folks. Uh, let's all share in it. Uh, we let the employees decide what machines we need to buy. We let everybody decide what, what customers will take on. We all get along good, uh, total respect. Um, it's, and well, it took time. This wasn't overnight. Trying to change a culture doesn't happen in six months or two years. <laughs> and I realize even in 10 years, it takes a long time to, to rid a company of its demons and its dysfunction. And I still remember the day my dad emptied the quarter barrel in the lunchroom sink because it had all gone stale. And he stood there cussing and swearing, what a waste, what a waste that we're pouring all this beer down the sink. <laughs> but that became a huge symbolic gesture or, or milestone that, wow, this is a different place. My dad passed away six and a half years ago of a sudden stroke. And he would bring his friends in and other people just to show them around to brag at what this place had become. And he didn't want anything to do with it, but there was no doubt in my mind that he was as proud as a dad could be. You know, the verse that says, now to him was able to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. That's what this place is right now. It's not just changing our lives, it's changing future generations' lives. We are setting a new legacy. It was at the 20 year mark I realized this is where I need to be. Even though I said, Laura, I'll go anywhere, do anything but here, I finally made peace. It was then I finally made peace that this is where I'm supposed to be. But it took 20 years to get there.